inform you will also get informed quickly yeah thank you dr hasrat yeah oh hello yeah hello very, everyone very nice today you have changed the costume yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> can't, can't repeat the same costume every day uh, yes, so sure. yes or sure. you are you are you are facing the camera <laughs> right yes yeah so it's just like a tv show for us <laughs> oh, oh, obviously yeah. you you yeah. are broad, you are broadcast on facebook <laughs> right yeah so thank you dr hasrat for giving this opportunity and uh, hello everyone ladies and gentlemen nice to meet you again for the third time here and uh, today as it is a, a very important session now it's uh, we are talking about uh, the wildlife management we are talking about eco tourism and the interface you know uh, and today we have uh, different uh, uh, speakers with us so i'll just uh, try to if you have not seen the agenda i will just go through the agenda once so we are aware what sessions we have uh, and what you know special topics are being covered as in this session so uh, just let me come to the agenda for i uh, guess so we have the chair professor dr nagozi she will be joining us soon i'm sure and then we have the four expert uh, faculty uh, presentation one on protected area management system by dr uh, k ramis from wii at the wildlife institute of india and then the second will be on eco tourism in protected area by uh, dr valery from ukraine then challenges in protected areas management by Shahidul Islam from Bangladesh and research in protected areas by Dr. Saibal Sain Gupta from India. And after that, once we complete the uh, the expert presentation, then we have these delegate presentation. And uh, today we have five presentation in this. Dr. Muhammad Omar uh, and uh, from Bangladesh, then from India, uh, Mr. Doran Chan Singh. Uh, then from Iran, Mr. Elmira, and from Philippines, Mr. Neil Jun, and from Ukraine, Dr. Tulina. And once again, I would like to inform that uh, the expert presentation will be 30 minutes each, and after uh, maybe 25 minutes, I'll just give you a hint that you have another five minutes to complete your uh, session. So please uh, stick to the time limit. And for the delegate presentation, we have 10 minutes allotted. So maybe after eight minutes, we can just give you an alarm that you have another two minutes to just complete and wind up your presentation. So without further delay, I would request our first presenter, Dr. K. Ramesh, who is a scientist E in the Wildlife Institute of India. Those who are not aware about uh, WII, I would like to inform you that WII is a premium institute in India as well as in Asia as far as wildlife uh, research and wildlife education is concerned. So over to you, uh, Dr. K. Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. And uh, so once again, uh, greetings uh, to all of you who are participating in the session. So this presentation, I think I needed to share the screen. Um, can anyone confirm whether it's uh, yes. visible? Yes, it is visible. Now it's on. Uh, is it moving? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, over, cool. Yeah, over okay. to you. Sir. Thank you. So uh, my uh, lecture today, I think as I understand, I have 25 minutes. I'll try to finish so that we can have more time for the uh, discussion. So, so it's about product area management system, but then I'll be giving you an overview of uh, how things are and uh, what are the system in place and uh, what we need to do. So I think uh, my lecture will include uh, the bit of historical perspective and uh, and a current perspective on what we might need to do. So before moving into, uh, I mean, I mean, of course, I would be taking a lot of examples from India, and uh, it's important to give the the background uh, um, information to give the perspective. So India is one of the 17 mega biodiversity countries of the world, as all of you know, and you also know those countries which which, which are those 17 uh, mega biodiversity countries. As you would see, uh, most of them would actually be represented in Asia and, and Africa. So, of course, we also categorize called mega diversity uh, countries. So, it's in Asia, it's India, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and China. 
So in terms of uh, the definition, uh, for those of you, you probably don't know what, what exactly the mega biodiversity means. It, it's basically the countries that have a 70 to 8 percent of the world's species pool. India being a kind of a very interesting uh, position and uh, because of the way the evolutionarily, the geologically it evolved and joining the mainland, because it is positioned itself in the, the junction of three major realms, okay? Paleoarctic, Ethiopian, and Oriental. So basically that put together the flow of uh, species assemblage and India having its own indigenous fauna probably, which actually carried a long time back. But then as we know, because of this confluence of position, we have the species representation from all these realms. So that makes India to be much more special uh, country uh, to have all the species composition. Among the kind of diversity, you see this number of species that you have here. I think we have about 26 recognized endemic centers for flowering plants, 30% of the world's flora, and 7.3% of global fauna. It's a humongous uh, species pool. And you can see the statistics here for the angiosperms, butterflies, fishers, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. These are basically the list uh, which probably can be added more and people are adding every day as we discussed. The notable wildlife values of India, because uh, if I talk about India, I cannot uh, miss uh, talking about tiger because India supports more than 70% of the global tiger population. We're talking about wild population, not the captive one. And we have about 60% of Asian elephant population. So this basically means that while India can be proud of having these species uh, in this many number, but we also shoulder a major responsibility towards conserving them. So nearly 80% of the one rhinoceros rhinoceros population is in India. Only subcontinent to have wild buffaloes, swamp deer, Asiatic wild ass. Exceptional mountain angular diversity with 19 species of them. Many subspecies occur as single population. So like lion, I mean, it's, uh, lion is also found in Africa, but then the subspecies, Pantherolis persica, is actually found in a very small population in the western part of India. We have Kashmir uh, stag or hangu, uh, which is found in the Himalayan mountains, so the Kashmir part of the, uh, the Himalaya. Then we have Manipur grow and red deer is found in the eastern part of India. Then we have hard ground barasinga, which is a swamp deer, which is found only in central Indian part. And we have very common species because we also, the India is also known for maintaining the common species because conservation point of view, protection point of view, uh, maintaining common species is important. These are, this is another one as an ill gift, wild, wild species I talked in the previous lecture. This also is a conflict species and uh, more of an edge species. So coming to uh, the protect area management system, I think if India is probably one of the very few countries which followed the scientific principle of establishing a protect area. So we had this, uh, the Bajarev zone classification. This was done through a scientific process and expert assessment, uh, making the India into 10 Bajarev zones. So these are uh, the trans Himalayas, the Himalaya desert, semi-arid system, Western Ghats, Deccan Peninsula, Gangetic Plain, coast, northeast, and islands. So these are those kind of uh, uh, categorization that uh, the India's the experts have been able to do. This is one of the classic document that we have, which was to guide the protected area distribution. Earlier, the protected areas were distributed based on known um, the sites, for species significance, or sometimes it was also converted uh, hunting grounds. So in order to ensure that representation in the protected area management system, I think the biogeography classification was very much uh, necessary and was done even today. It is kind of guided by this principle. The, the, of, there are of course improvements that many of the experts are uh, seeking and to see what exactly the biogeography classification should be. Nevertheless, this categorization is the guiding principle as of now. To give you background, what this, uh, uh, these biozer zones are, because these biozer zones actually represent each of the system and have its unique species. And if you go to the trans Himalayas, you will find the snow leopard to be the key species, and uh, then um, black neck crane. And in the Himalayas, you have this uh, mountain temperate region, which categorized into three parallel zones. And uh, even elephants, from elephants to, you know, all fowls, jungle, jungle fowl. And all, some of the species like rhododendron is very prominent. Then go to the desert and you have unique species and the system and the people. I mean, each of this categorization also talks about not only the species, the cultural aspect of the area, because that is a human dimension to this whole 
relationship with this product management system. And the semi arid system, as it mentioned, it's Lion and you have Blackbirds and Chinkara. And Western Guards is the endemic system, is long stretch, starting from the Western coast, you know, in the Gujarat to all the way into Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And we have uh, rolling meadows like uh, Sholas and endemic elk, elk lantern macaque, Nilgiri tar, and elephant. And we have Deccan Peninsula, Peninsula dominated by tiger and gaur and some of the species. And Ganges Plain, uh, which is again with the swamp deer, rhinos, elephants, and coast has a large number of uh, you know, coastal marine uh, species. And some of them are very endemic and diverse, including uh, those uh, olive ridley turtles. And Northeast has got a lot of endemic species and very special to them. And we have red pandas, rhinos, you know, macaque species, you know, including gibbons, yeah, and golden lungus, and islands. Uh, there are several islands. We have two main group of islands, Lakshadweep and Andaman Islands. So the problem with all this uh, protected area management, because see, these are the background to this, but then why we need this kind of set-aside management, although it is driven by the global uh, uh, the concern for setting aside the area for conservation, starting with the 5%, 15%, and uh, now we're talking about 50% area, whether that's practically possible or not, but that's... Uh, uh, the agenda that we all have. The reason being, this is classical. So you can see this with the human population increase, what, where we have lost is only on nature. So that basically puts things to, into this kind of situation where we face a lot of disasters because protected areas becomes a, like kind of a protected zone to kind of minimize or stop such disasters. So habitat fragmentation is the biggest threat because if you don't protect the areas, then you're going to have a smaller fragments. So with the smaller fragments, we have already have scientific evidence have smaller fragments have species. It's not about even talking about individual populations decline. It's a, even a species number is getting declined when there's a fragment. Linear infrastructure, if you don't have a protected area set aside, linear infrastructure can cause havoc and there are lots and lots of evidences. Land degradation, mining, again, if you don't protect them, the protected system. So these are going to be uh, some of the major damages that we may have. Hydropower, of course, we need all of them. Mountain system is particularly is uh, drawn into this kind of uh, management challenges because one side we need uh, hydropower, other side we needed to uh, kind of ensure the biodiversity of the tunic system remains. So it's a big challenge, but then it's something that we as a professional needed to uh, live with and address on. And the human interference leads to resource conflict. So the resource conflict con causes the negative response and including the disease, uh, which is something that we needed to take note of because how the protected area system can actually allow this to be handled. If you don't have them, this, this which I talked about, the blurred interface can actually cause havoc even in terms of pandemic. So this is one of the study by my student which completed PhD very recently. It's looking at the modification riverine habitat in the Western Himalayas, how it affects, because it affects the natural flow regime. Okay, it actually affects the, you know, the natural banks through land use changes, it completely changes into you know, natural areas into much more concretized area because we have a lot of evidences without bank vegetation, the, the diversity along the river system will get lost. So modification leads to you no know, these kind of uh, major uh, uh, problems. I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, but it is there. And we also see that the river bird conservation is kind of linked to the protective network. So because only we have a very limited support system coming from protected area because large uh, species pools of river birds are outside the protected network, except some of the protected area which is able to protect them, that we still needed to have this scope expanded. So coming specifically into the way this is management, uh, protected area management system operates in India, you can see this, this is a kind of a protected network distribution all over the country. Okay, so we are now nearing to 5% of the geography area, which is from a global perspective is good, but then if you look at the forest cover, the protected forest, I mean, it, it's also kind of different, similar category in terms of protection. So that's going to 25 above percentage. And if you include uh, the other natural areas, it will also increases. In terms of the category that we have in India is about, uh, these are the national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, community reserves and conservation reserves. We also have elephant reserve, tiger reserve, but then in terms of the legal sanctity to uh, under the Wildlife Protection Act, these are the categories. But uh, national parks means that there's no human intervention whatsoever. Wildlife sanctuaries, some access is allowed. 
Community reserve is a land owned by the community but has got biodiversity value. So the conservation reserve is a land owned by the government but then has got the human interface activities are there. So starting 1988, now 2019, I mean, now it's 2021, this is, the list has been updated. So we have about uh, 870 uh, protect areas as in total, kind of protecting 5% 5, 5 of the geography area. So the, initially starting with the land focus, which is started with the man and biosphere reserve concept, where we had core, buffer, and transition zones. Uh, but then uh, we had moved on from land focus to we have species focus, which is a project tiger, uh, focusing on one umbrella species, then saying that, okay, this could actually benefit the larger species. This is happening because India's conservation, in at least in the mainland, is driven by tiger, and that has really contributed tremendously. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, professionals and officers who have been able to contribute to this the transformation, I would say. And then ultimately, whether you have land concept or species concept, but the whole conservation viability will be land species uh, you know, relationship or nexus, you call it. Because from the meta population context, because individuals or species or even you know, the diversity, if you take island biogeography concept, I think this meta population always is a major driver because there is a land and species relationship are so strong, you can't differentiate. Therefore, we needed to look at integrated landscape management strategies. Currently, even though we have a protected area system in place and that's increasing with the number, but the whole operational paradigm has changed, which is looking at integrated landscape management, which is really uh, looking at uh, the entire the biogeric zone or even other land forms, which is defined either for the land or species. So one can actually look at uh, the details of the species uh, or land into a surrogate model. So this is an, one example where Central India, we could look at landscape characterization, putting together surrogate habitat diversity so that you ensure you know, conservation values in each of the system. So therefore, you don't miss out on any representation uniqueness of each of the system. So landscape characterization is very much important that has been done. And then using some of the species distribution modeling, one can basically, this is an example, not just India. It's a, one example is picked up how people's species distribution model can happen. But ultimately, putting the land and species together, the spatial prioritization, this is a, not a new concept. It is there for setting aside a protected area, but for even within the existing landscape, one can identify where your priority areas can go. So taking a protected area context, protected area being the center of the, the conservation value, or it's a, I would say it's a reservoir. I mean, it's more of an area which we basically preserve, but then doesn't mean that area outside is less important. So this landscape concept is takes this into accommodation and then allows uh, for us to expand the vision and scope of conservation to a large landscape. Because the decision making, I needed to actually look at you know, alternatives because we have a productive system, we are looking at the benefits, and we also need to look, need to look at what are the alternatives. That's where the, the whole large landscape integrated management strategy comes up because we have a lot of wildlife values even outside the protected network. Therefore, we look at alternatives, we look at uncertainty and look at high risk consequences, look at interpersonal issues and complexities because these are some of the elements which are very important on, in wildlife, you know, in the protected area system and in a larger landscape system because you need to visualize this large landscape system is kind of an integrated model rather than protected area and outside protected area because part of this landscape, you have the protected area. But moving forward, it's also important to know how secure our protected areas are That's because whether it's a climate change effect or all of the you know, large scale and normal issues. So globally, there is a process that has been done. So management evaluation, you know, effect, management effectiveness evaluation process. So this is looking at in different concept, how these protected areas are managed for India, this has been a thorough process, especially for Tiger Reserve and also for other reserves. People are looking at different categories based on the scores. So one is able to categorize the protected area into very good, good, satisfactory, poor. This allows a manager to take note of and then look at very specific point where the score is affected. So then work around, instead of looking at very general you know, model when there are specific inputs that can go into the protected management. So which basically then allows us to focus on you know, kind of a very 
focused conservation outcome because in addition to the land and the species focus i said because there are species which live exclusive protected area there are species which lives beyond the protected area so all this can be brought under a specialized conservation strategy so in india we have been able to have species specific focus under this even species recovery plan on species like tiger snow leopard turtle wolf you no know, brown leopard deer gadial and lion so all the species are now taken up as a special focus and then we have large scale survey programs which guides the process of our conservation agenda and we have a technical support system already in place for species recovery i know for nation context so tiger recovery uh, in india has been taken as a good model and species in other countries uh, like cambodia and many other countries i think this exchange of knowledge is taking place where you know the conservation discourse can be taken up so similarly we have ex expertise developed on large scale transportation of herbivores from one place to other and then special focus on snow leopard looking at uh, the security of the himalayan system so it has been uh, done and uh, how much over the land area is very complex and challenging but then conservation inputs have to go on so people are coming people are coming up with the different different models now undp and other players are come up with a new model called secure himalaya which is a value of the protected area in each of the landscape and we have special focus on the you know some marine sorry the vegetation and the floral system and the interrelation to between other disturbance elements and marine sector yes there are special focus and we have uh, the specific activities on uh, the key species like uh, olive ridley turtle trying to monitor them use the technology and trying to provide suggestion uh, with respect to the development uh, aspirations or the agenda of the country and there are guidelines that is being done uh, to deal with the linear infrastructure in the protected area system or outside the protected area system and also getting into um, you know the climate change um, impacts assessment so we have the next, the whole lot of mission the national mission the national action plan climate change under which we have an exclusive mission for the himalayas the mountains a national mission on sustaining himalayan ecosystems in which i have been very much part and trying to develop uh, spatial models to see where the vulnerability is very high and the other one is a specific program on the landscape models we have the landscape based system there is a, i mean these are the things that i'm highlighting as a case for us for some of you listening maybe try to look through the details and see whether there can be some lesson drawn from this and we have this other forest and you know, restoration project focusing on some of the key species the species list is getting added more and more and we have special focus on the entire ganges as of the main one of the top 10 rivers in the world so with the focus on you know the biodiversity capacity building restoration you know so setting up uh, some centers to rescue and rehabilitation and community based programs and things like that so basically uh, uh, summing up this whole uh, the narration uh, that i was just trying to present so we have the protected area system which is driven by certain scientific processes uh, by the classification from a land focus approach is also there and there's a species focus approach is also there then we are looking at more of integrated approach so this is specifically more relevant now with the covid and post covid situation because we know now it is going to be a new normal situation for all of us and one health which is linking the environment health the animal health i know and the the people health is going to be one health concept which is evolving so with under the protected area system or under the integrated management system that is going to be there because this is allowing us to take on this adaptive management strategy accounting for this new normal and one health so that's a kind of path that we basically looking at it ultimately the solutions are going to be integrated nature health solutions because nature has its own strategies unless we allow for our own uh, options um suppose if the nature can have its resilience capacity we really need to know what is a tipping point that we can play around with because most of us play around with nature as if nothing is going to happen but there's a lot at stake so the attitude of us the culture of us nature of us is going to be the deciding factor therefore the integrated landscape strategy you no know, kind of amplifies the integrated nature culture solutions yeah so that's a kind of take home message i like to present as a protected area system management so thank you uh, everyone
Yeah, thank, right. you, doc thank you, Dr. Ramesh. And I think it was well within time. You still have time, but I think we will utilize that time for uh, the remarks also. But uh, thank you for covering and you know giving a detailed uh, presentation on uh, the protected area management. You talked about the 17 mega biodiversity, the, bi the different biogeographic zones, and also showed the lovely biodiversity of each uh, biogeographic zones and also the problems that are faced in protected area management system and the different protected area management programs that are being executed and implemented uh, by, uh, you know, in India, by ministry and by your institution. And also you have been part of these important, you know, programs. Uh, we have also been joined by our chair, Professor Dr. Ngozi. A very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Ngozi. And, uh, I would uh, request you to give your remarks, uh, you know, on uh, Dr. K. Rami's presentation, you know, over to you. Hello, hello everyone. Um, sorry I joined late, I'm sure I got the time wrong, but um, I was very happy to join in at a time where um, the critical aspects of protected area management were actually being discussed. I think everything with respect to protected area management is very critical because 